Blessed are those who believe so strongly in God's word as being the truth that they're not only willing to meditate on God's word day and night, but they're also willing to take everything that they read, every passage, every section of scripture, and put it into practice. They are truly the living sacrifices. You know, blessed are they. But do we find most of those people inside the church? The answer is yes and no. The reality is, is that we as Christians, we've been polluted by the world. There's an awful lot of people inside of this world that tell us all their beliefs, their ideals, and they have sold them to us. And as a result of that, we as Christians are having a really hard time trying to get to the truth and sticking with it. Living in a culture that has relegated truth to nothing more than mere perceptions, created and deconstructed from one mind to the next, it's no surprise that there's an awful lot of Christians that don't believe in the truth, don't believe that every single word of God's, God, that God's given to us is true. This should not make us surprised. And I don't think we should be. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, there will come a time when people will not put up the sound doctrine. There will come a time when they'll only want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. I think we're living in that day. I think the church desperately needs individuals to stand up to be teachers and preachers of God's word and not to compromise with it. I know it's awful tempting, especially as a pastor, to compromise with the world so that the people sitting in the pews might feel better, but that's not our role as pastors. Our role is to teach the truth, to tell the world about the truth, to tell the church about the truth, and not to compromise in any way, shape, or form. This sermon series is going to have two parts. The first part of this series is going to look at the truth concerning God. The truth about his word, truth of his love letter that he's given to us. And the second part is going to ask a very difficult question. And that is, if so many Christians believe that God's word is true, then why are so many Christians tearing out pages out of their Bible? Those sections that they don't believe in or don't agree with. Let's start off first and foremost, I want to say, is God's word true? Based on this pastor, I'm going to tell you, I believe 100% God's word is true true absolutely you know what the world they're very interested in a lot of different things you can go into the bible and you can find out some foundational questions you can find the answers to them such as who created the universe you know why am i here and what will happen to me when i die but can we assume inside of our churches most christians have gone beyond that and said i think god's word should be used to navigate or tell me what i should do in every circumstance those who outright reject the Bible as being absolute truth not only come from outside the church, but partially inside as well. They give several different reasons. Number one, they look at oral tradition. And they say, we can't accept that. You know, when you think about Moses, now he supposedly wrote, and I think he did, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Now, when you look at that, oh my goodness, that means that Moses wrote about events, creation, that he wasn't even present for. That happened thousands of years before his existence. How did he know about creation? How did he know that God actually took six days to create this world? And on the seventh day he rested. How did he know that? And the answer is oral tradition. People passed down the stories of God's creation all the way from Adam and Eve all the way to Moses. Now, critics would say, you know what? I, I understand what you're saying, but you know how people pass things around now today. As soon as you pass it from one person to the next, it gets modified or changed. How do you know that God's word is true? After all, it's been passed down through so many people. The second thing that people usually object to is the sin of the writers, especially from the outside world. People who are not inside the church, they often say, you know what? The human beings who wrote God's word ultimately were sinful. Everybody sins and falls short of God's glory. Therefore, how do you know their sins didn't taint what they wrote. The third thing is contradictions. People will look at the Bible and they criticize it. They say, you know what, there's contradictions within God's word. One part will say one thing to be true and the other part will say something else is true, which would be the opposite to what was said prior to. And the fourth thing is there's no original manuscripts. If you ask me, pastor, can you show me Paul his original writing, or his scribe who wrote for him, I'll have to say, no, I cannot show you that. Can you show me Moses' original writing? No, I cannot show you that either. We don't have any of the original manuscripts that exist. 
And number five, the translations of God's holy word. There's lots of those. And um, as you look at them uh, over time, God's word gets translated over and over again in order to make it so that people of our culture can understand what's being said. A lot of critics say, you know what? There's a big temptation there for people who are transcribing God's word to basically change it, to make it more palatable for our society. So the question is, what does the evidence show? And I think the evidence is real, first and foremost. One document claiming to know everything that happened in the past, that's quite, a, quite an establishment. That's quite a statement, and God's word does claim to do that. Often, I think we view history, though, in general, as being something that is factual and 100% true. You know what? That's not true. Pick up a history book, any history book that you want to pick up. Go pick one up, open it up. Is it 100% true? The answer is no, it's not. It has been written based on probabilities. In other words, the person had to go and collect all the sources they possibly could about a particular event, and they had to look at all the evidence, and they had to say, what makes sense? What fits? What actually happened to the best of our abilities? What actually occurred? Now, unless we have a time machine, we simply cannot go back in time and figure out what exactly occurred. We can't do that. Therefore, we had to work with these probabilities. History, truthfully, is a mere reconstruction of event based on the details that can be dug up about that event and the highest probability that those details are true. Now, there's two litmus tests the historians always use. Number one, the probabilities are increased when evidence is collected from more than one source. In other words, if you hear a story about an event from a live witness and they say the following happened, A, B, and C, and then you go to another witness and you say, were you at the event? And they say, yes. And then you say, well, what happened? And they say, A, B, and C. And you go to another one and they say, A, B, and C. There's a pretty good chance that A, B, and C are actually true. If a whole bunch of people vary on what they see, then it becomes very difficult to figure out what historically happened. When multiple sources give the exact same details of an event, there's a pretty good chance that those details are true. Number two, also, the closer the person is to an actual event who's telling you what happened, the more likelihood that they are right, that they're not tainting anything. The more likelihood anyway. So if you get a whole bunch of people that are saying the same thing, and they're really close to the event, uh, in other words, eyewitnesses, and they're all recording the same thing, then a pretty good chance historically, bang on, you've got exactly what happened. That's the litmus test. Two of them. So let's take a look at them. Do we have that kind of litmus test that we can apply against the Bible? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes, we can. There are multiple sources of the Bible. There's multiple pieces, in other words, that were written by more than one account. And all of them agree with each other. Let's look at the first one. The first one, as you can see on the screen, which would be at the very top, and it's like a, kind of a brown piece of paper, and you can see the writing on it. And that one there is called the papri. And that came around, it was manufactured in Egypt as early as the 4th century BC. They took a papri plant and they basically, you know, kind of smashed it, put some chemicals to it, but flattened it out, basically dried it out, and then they wrote on it. Now, this was their first way of writing before paper came along. It wasn't invented until about 100 BC, paper. And it wasn't really widely used in 100 BC, it was actually later on in that. The oldest source that we have comes from the papri plant in uh, second century BC of the Bible. There's 86 papri plants, little particles of God's holy word, containing verses and sections of God's word that match exactly what we have today. Praise be to God for that. There's some good evidence. Second thing, leather. You can see that just right beside of it, that big long black thing that you can see. Not overly pretty, but it lasted a lot better than the papri plant. And on leather, you could write on it and you could actually see the words a lot clearer than you could the papri plant, and it would last a lot longer. Do we have some of these kicking around? And the answer is yes. 274 of these actually exist, and they contain God's holy word, and they're written exactly the same way as we have in our Bible today. Praise be to God for that. Let's look at the next one. Minuscules. That's in the bottom right, the bottom left-hand corner, the little piece of paper that you can barely see the writing. It's called a minuscule for a reason. There's only usually one verse on it, possibly two. Never much more than that. Do we have some of these? Yes, we do. We have approximately 2,795 of these. And again, 
they give the verses exactly the same as what we have in today's scripture. Now, if you look up in the very top right-hand corner, you can see that this is called a lectionary. It's a worship guide, and within that worship guide, of course, there's scripture. And do we have some of these? Yes, we have about 2,209 of these. And again, they all give the same thing as we can see inside scripture. And the last one, in the very bottom right-hand corner, looks like a book. It's what it is. Do we have physical, a full copy of God's holy word? And if we do, how far back can we see that? Around the 4th to 5th century BC, we have multiple copies of God's holy word. So, we have quite a bit of evidence. In other words, um, God's Not Dead came out and they said in, in their uh, video series, they said approximately 20,000 documents of God's holy word exist and every single one of them agrees with what we have. That's a lot of evidence. Oh my goodness, 20,000 documents. Now let me give you a little idea. Ancient historical books such as Plato, Caesar, Pliny, uh, Tacitus, or Herodotus have approximately 20 copies, 20 different things that say, yes, you are right. Yes, this is what actually physically happened. Only 20, and the Bible has 20,000. So is the Bible got enough evidence to say what it's talking about actually happened? The answer is yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Let's look at the next thing, textual accuracy. Does the Bible have textual problems? Okay. You know, remember the critic? The critic said, you know what? There's a lot of contradictions inside of God's holy word. There's approximately, according to the critics, 300,000 textual variations. In other words, things don't seem to be the same amongst all of these, these uh, manuscripts that we have. There's a bunch of spelling mistakes. There's a bunch of inverted phrases. But ultimately, there seems to be some outright mistakes, they would say. I'll give you some examples of, of what they consider to be outright mistakes. The number of arms-bearing men in Judah and Israel, 2 Samuel 24, 9, was about 800,000. and 1 Chronicles, it's 1.1 million. That's an awful big difference between the two numbers. So critics would say, hey, he didn't get the number right. Is God's word true then? The number of Syrian charioteers slain by David was approximately 700, and 1 Chronicles says that it was 7,000. Again, same idea. You know, what's going on here? We got two different numbers inside of scripture. The number of stalls Solomon had in 1 Kings 4.26 was 40,000. In 2 Chronicles 9.25, it was 4,000. The number of baths in the Molten Sea, 1 Kings 7.23, uh, was approximately 2,000. 2 Chronicles 4.5 was approximately um, 3,000. There are date discrepancies. When was Jesus born? Matthew 2.1 seems to indicate approximately 4 B.C., whereas Luke says approximately 8 A.D. seems to infer that. Lots of different issues. I went on the Internet. I was really curious. I wanted to know, how many contradictions does the naysayers say exist inside the Bible? In other words, people who don't like the Bible, don't believe in the Bible, are going against it. How many things did they find? Contradictions. 101. 101 different ones. I found this on a website. A really neat website. And it listed all these contradictions, supposedly inside the Bible. So I thought, you know what? That's a lot of evidence. Maybe they've got something to say about this topic. And then I went on another website that basically said, look, let me handle all 101 of them. And I found out there was a reason for every one of them. They weren't contradictions at all. When you took the culture into relation or into aspect in each one of the cases, there was actually a solution for every one of them. For instance, when an army is counted, well, it might say, for instance, inside of God's holy word, that the army was a certain amount of people. Let's say 500 people. And later on, it could say in another spot it was 800 people. Well, the reason why is that one spot actually counted the fighting man and the other spot counted all people that could fight. You can see where a different perspective can still be true, but at the same time, a person can jump to the conclusion wrongly that, hey, there must be an error in the Bible. There must be some kind of lie. What did I find out overall? Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. God's Not Dead, the series said there might be 40 lines inside of God's Holy Word with variations. And they said out of that, none of it affects our theology. Not even one bit. So I thought, you know what? Good for you. That sounds really good. And out of those 40, I would argue all 40 of them, none of them are a contradiction at all. 
We have to understand the culture. <coughs> Pardon me. We have to know what the culture says. We've got to understand that in different dialects, in different places, people see things differently. And when we understand that culture, it's not a problem. There are no contradictions inside of God's holy word. Not a single one. What about textual accuracy? There are different types of Bible translations. There's lots of them out there. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see that some of those Bible translations go for word for word. In other words, some of them, such as the NSAB, the ESV, the AMP, even the King James Version, tries to take the Greek or the Hebrew and transcribes them word for word. In other words, what is the Greek word? This is what the English word is supposed to be. Okay, then put it in. It makes a very wooden translation. It doesn't make for very easy readability, but at the same time, it's 100% a translation word for word, one to the other. Some people like thought for thought, and you get a whole grouping of individual Bibles that are done that, like the NAB or the NIV. They like to take what was the thought in Greek, now what should that same thought, identical thought be, how can we write it in English? Okay? And now if you want to really go on the wide side of the spectrum, you can go to paraphrase. And that would be like the, the Message Bible or the TLB. That's where you actually take the um, Greek or the Hebrew and you basically paraphrase it, rewrite it, and put it in today's lingo. And of course, there's a few issues with that. The question is, is that okay? The critic would say, you know what? They're rewriting God's Word. Every time they transcribe God's Word again, they're rewriting it and make it more palatable for society. And the answer is no, that's not what they're doing at all. And I can prove that. Here's the thing. If somebody came along and gave us a brand new NIV Bible, let's say, and let's say they did do that. They looked at the culture and said, you know what? Ah, it's not very popular in this culture, let's say, for abortion. It's not very popular in this culture to say it's wrong to abort a child. Do you honestly think they would change God's holy word when it comes to abortion? Any verses pertaining to it? And the answer is no, because we still have the Greek and the Hebrew. We still got those manuscripts. They still exist from the 4th and the 5th century BC. And at any time, these scholars, Greek and Hebrew scholars, which I'm not one of them, but I can tell you there's some very smart individuals out there who study Greek and Hebrew all their life. If we go and change or anybody changes God's word, they're going to speak up and say no. No, you can't change that. No, that's not what the original Greek or Hebrew said. No, I know that's what culture wants you to say, but no, you have transcribed it with an error in it. So, has anybody really changed it? Maybe in the paraphrase, one could argue yes, somewhat, but for NIV and all the thought for thought and the word for word translations, not one bit, not one bit. Nobody's changing God's word and nobody can because we still have the 4th and century BC transcripts. That's important for us to get. Let's look at close proximity. I gave you a Bible time timeline here, and I found this on the internet. I thought it was kind of cool. It tells us roughly when all the different books are written. Now, of course, this is up to debate. You know what? We're not really sure out of all the books of the Bible, their exact dates, but this gives us a rough idea. The oldest book that we have most likely is Job, um, the earliest one that was written, the oldest one. Um, I don't know when it was written. Nobody does. But ultimately, if we look at um, Moses' time, then we get a little bit of an idea roughly when it was written, and that's around um, 3500, um, around 1300 BC. So if about 1300 BC. So we got thinking about that. You know what? How then can we say God's word is accurate? Moses, after all, was not there for creation. So the critic would say, how in the world did Moses know what actually happened during creation to write it down in the first place? Well, the way that he knew was through oral tradition. And I've talked about that. People don't necessarily in this world like oral tradition. Today, we're not very good at memorizing things. Today, we're not very good at passing orally facts from one person to the other. We're actually very poor at that. And uh, I got thinking, if today somebody did that, Mark something, told something orally from one person to the next, I would question it. I would say, well, it kind of sounds like hearsay. And it kind of sounds like it's not going to be accurate. And it wouldn't be today. But back then, they had a lot of discipline. They had no paper, they had nothing to write on, so how they passed things down from one generation to the next was orally. They memorized and they were meticulous at it. And historians ultimately will come forward very quickly and defend the Bible on this particular point because they'll say, you know what, most of our history books, 
that we have, the history that we have before the time that we had paper, almost all of that, or dare I say all of it, is all based on oral tradition or archaeology or something else that must be interpreted. And they would say, you know what? Our history that we have orally has been passed down. And we consider acceptable, as long as there's lots of manuscripts of, or lots of people that back it up orally, then we're going to say, hey, it's the truth. In other words, if five different people come forward and say the same thing about an event that happened 2,000 years ago, and they come up with the same conclusion, then it must have happened. That's the way we got to look at this. There undoubtedly, the Old Testament has some issues this way because of oral tradition. But the surprising thing for me is that in 90 AD, when the, when the people sat down, they said, you know what, what's going to be our Old Testament Bible? And they were trying to determine what books belong in and what shouldn't be in. They sat down, they were 100% in agreement. They had no problem. It took them no time at all to come up with the books. No time at all. They just sat down and said, yes, not a problem. Now, let's talk about the New Testament. The New Testament's a little bit different. It has one really good plus going for it and one minus. So, so let's look at the plus first. First and foremost, the plus is, is that the people that wrote, wrote within 25 years of the actual events. So that oral tradition wasn't a big factor. And the majority of the people who wrote in the New Testament were either eyewitnesses or they talked to eyewitnesses as they wrote. So again, there we go. We've got people very close to the actual events. They were part of the events or they were alive during those events, which is really good. Now, let's go to the negative side of it. The negative side is it took about 200 years for the people actually to agree what books belong in the New Testament. There were a lot of people that were saying a lot of things about Jesus Christ, and a lot of them were false. And there were a lot of people writing a lot of books and saying, hey, I, I knew James, so they wrote a book. Or I knew Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, so they wrote a book. Or I knew John, so they wrote their own book. And a lot of them had to be thrown out because they weren't true. They were made up lies. And the historians, the people, Arrhenius in particular, he had to go through all of those books that said they were part of the Bible, that said that we know the truth about Jesus Christ, and he had to sift through all of those. And it took him a couple hundred years, the, the group of individuals, to say, yes, we've got 27 books. And that was done in 397 BC, or 397 AD. Wow. So do we have ample evidence that the New Testament is true and real? The answer is 100% yes. Now, how does it compare to other documents, historical documents? Homer's Iliad was written approximately 500 years after the events occur, and yet nobody ever questions whether or not the events happen or not. We just look at it and say, historically, he's got to be right. He's within 500 years. The Bible was written portions of the New Testament within 25 years. So obviously, there's truth to it. Now, I want to get the really big one here predictability. And I think this is where the Bible shines. The Bible is not just a historical document. Far from that. The, the Bible is God's holy word. It is God's word. It is divine. It's been inspired by God, written by God. So you can only expect there's going to be a lot of miracles in there. And there's going to be a lot of things that are going to point to the fact that God's word is going to predict events that just simply could not, no one could predict. And actually they did. 300 different references to the Messiah have been given before the Messiah showed up. 300 of them in the Old Testament. And the probability of just eight of those prophecies coming true inside of one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, is one in 100 quadrillion. A number I can't even fathom. And I do accounting. That's my main job. So I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute now. What's the probability that uh, all 300 prophecies, and they all came true in Jesus Christ, what's the probability of that happening to one person? And the answer is, statistically, it's an impossibility. And yet it still happened. God's word is true. There is not one prophecy that God has given that has not come true. Not one. Not a single one if the events already happened. There are prophecies that are, were waiting to be fulfilled, absolutely, but anything that was prophesied, any event that's already happened, 100% God's word has been perfect, 100% accurate. And the chances of that happening are zero. Any other book that you can think of, not one can make that claim, that they've been 100% accurate in their prophecy. 
Not a single one. Now, given that's all said, I got thinking. Obedience. It's one thing to say God's word is true. It's completely another thing to obey God's word. It's one thing to say that God's word is 100% accurate and truth. It's another thing to bow our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to follow it. You know, I want to talk about that. But first, I want to go through some verses. Blessed are those who are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do not know, they do no wrong, but they follow all of his ways. You have been laid down his precepts. They're supposed to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Psalms 119, verses 1 to 8. The word of God is supposed to be a pearl or a treasure to us. I want to apologize. My voice is not very good. And I hope and pray you've been able to basically survive this sermon. I know it's not the 100%. It's not my best. That's for sure. But I hope and pray the words, I know they're from God, and I hope and pray that you've been listening to the words and the meaning. In this particular verse, the psalmist is saying God's word is everything to him. He says, ultimately, everything about God's word makes him smile. Blessed are those who believe God's word is 100% true and accurate. Blessed be those people who believe that God's word is the source of their life. Blessed be those people who have a complete faith and a complete trust in God and don't question his word but want to live according to that word. Blessed be those people. While the psalmist is fully aware, (coughs) pardon me, that he has problems, that he has sin, and that he's a fallible creature. While the psalmist fully understands that he's not right in God's sight, in so many respects, he cries out to God and says to him, help me, O Lord. Help me to be more like you. Help me to be like you. I want you to take this challenge. And again, I thank you for, for uh, I guess, uh, persevering through this sermon. I want to finish this part of this sermon with a great and wonderful challenge to you. Having 22 different stanzas of eight verses apiece, Psalms 119 is one of the longest books in the entire Bible. In this acrostic poem, one hears the words of the psalmist who has an absolute devotion to God and unwavers in his desire, I think, to serve God and to make sure he obeys every single word God gives him. At least 171 of the 176 verses in Psalms 119 explicitly refers to God's precepts, his laws, his commandments, the decrees of God, every single one of them. From one central theme, and that theme is know and obey God. I want to give you this challenge, and I I know it's it's one of those things that I hope and pray you might want to do. The next part of the sermon series is going to get very serious, and hopefully my voice is getting better by then. But it's a really serious challenge. The next part, I'm going to talk about the pages we rip out, and we do. I want to talk about all the different places in God's holy word that we take the pages and we tear them out because we don't want to obey them. I want to talk about Christians who actually come forward and say, I don't believe in that. I know it's in God's word, but I don't believe in it. I want to talk about that because that is real. But to get there, I want you to get the appreciation of God's word that the psalmist had in Psalms 119. So I want to give you this challenge. For this next week, each and every single day, read Psalms 119. 171 verses, it's not that long. I know it's a long chapter, but it's not that long. 171 verses, read it once a day for the next seven days. And when you listen again, I hope and pray you're ready. With that kind of thanksgiving in your heart the psalmist had, I hope and pray you're ready to say, I believe, I believe. Now, while you're reading Psalms 119, I want to give you one more challenge. I want you to think about what are the areas of God's word that I don't believe and I don't obey? What area has this culture told me that they're right and God is wrong? 
And I've actually agreed to them with them. What areas do I fall short of God's glory? Think about that. Pray about that. Be ready and open for next week because I can tell you it's going to be a challenge. Not just for you, but also for me because there's lots of places that I can always improve upon. So thank you again for listening and uh, hopefully next week my voice will clear up and we can really get down to the heart of why do we tear up the out of God's word.